did my, my amateur days in, in Italy. Here we race there just before it happened. Danni incalcolabili al patrimonio artistico. Il premier Berlusconi sta firmando in questi momenti lo stato di emergenza nazionale. Una tragedia dunque per tutta la regione ma per tutta l'Italia soprattutto. When homes started shaking and collapsing across the medieval city of L'Aquila, thousands of buildings which have stood for centuries simply crumpled to the grounds. People under this would have stood no chance. Then when the disaster struck, uh, not long after, you were kind of shell-shocked because we were literally right in that region right before it happened. It was kind of scary, so then to go back there just over a year later, first year as a pro and take the pink jersey, it was... Um, at least I, I kind of really knew what they were going through and even on that day it was a terrible day but you could see the carnage that it caused um, the year before, uh, that massive earthquake. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia, brought to you by I Woke Up. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Today we are in L'Aquila. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with uh, Sean Kelly. <laughs> Just wearing Sean Kelly's. Uh, Cas Casquette, Richard. I'm not actually Sean Kelly. And Alberto Tomba. Based on what? I've just come yes, back from a like run. A, you're, yeah, you look like you're in skin gear. You've got a big ski type, ski style headband on with, with sunglasses. I was reminded of um, Alberto Tomba, La Bomba, um, quite a lot over the last few days because he was big, big chum of uh, Mario Cipollini. You know, Tomba was from Tuscany. Um, which is not an area that most people associate with skiing, but I think his his sort of home resort was also Cipollini's home resort, um, Abetone, which is also a famous destination in cycling. We saw Alberto Tomba at the start of the Giro last year, didn't we, in Bologna? We did, yeah, we yeah. did. Anyway, we were played in there um, by uh, Richie Port, who's the subject of today's episode. I normally start by saying, where are we, Lionel? Where are we, Lionel? Well, we're in L'Aquila for our rest day. L'Aquila, of course, was hit by a terrible earthquake in 2009. And in 2010, the Giro d'Italia visited, had a stage finish in the town. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, that particular stage because it was the day that Richie Port took the pink jersey. And it was a, well, one of the most memorable days in the last 10 years of Giro history, wasn't it? Just scraping into the last 10 years of Giro history, isn't it? It is. Can I? Can we have a, a real-time corrections corner immediately? Yeah. Um, of course, Alberto Tomber isn't from... Um, isn't from Tuscany because we saw him in Bologna last year and he was in Bologna because he's from that area isn't he but I think my point still stands about um, Abetone being his home resort and Bologna is not not exactly mountainous either and, it, and it's pretty close to Tuscany isn't it it is and in fact um, if you go to sort of Florence from Bologna that is one way to go over those mountains where I think I mean I might well be wrong about this as well but i, I think um tom may used to ski there anyway it's our rest day no cycling for us richard on the virtual giro our giro on the rgt platform my legs have certainly appreciated a day off what about yours well uh i've not actually had a day off because i had to do saturday stage today lionel because i took a rest day on saturday oh i, so if, I don't know if that's cheating or well challenge mallorca know, but... rules we established that at the start didn't we um, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. I needed a rest day on Saturday for practical reasons. But I've done some laundry. I've been watching some press conferences on YouTube just to get into the rest day spirit. What about that lovely drive over the Apennines last night from Salerno, from or just outside Naples? You must have enjoyed that, Napalm. We're getting into your your territory now. The sort of wild boar kind of lovely wild boar ragouts mm. and you know thick kind of peachy type yeah. pasta, sausagey, meaty, gamey, good. Nice region of Italy. Yeah, truff, truffle. Mm. There's a great bit in the um, Dino Buzzati book, Rich. We were just talking about that before um, we started recording today about 
um, how the, the the real sort of soul of Italy and the Giro lies in the central regions, and it doesn't a Giro doesn't feel complete and unless it goes to those regions. It's it actually disappointed me a, a little bit when I saw the Giro route announced this year that there wasn't much time or well, going to be spent in Tuscany, Umbria, um, Abruzzo, those regions. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at our Giro d'Italia, brought to you by Iwaka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. IWOCA.co.uk Thank you very much indeed to our title sponsors, Iwaka. Very proud to have them as our main supporters and uh, they're enabling us to be here covering our Giro. Um, Iwaka are an award-winning finance company who specialise in lending to small businesses. They were founded in 2011 and they have issued more than a billion pounds to companies ranging from startups to established businesses. If you'd like to know more about Iwaka and they support cycling as well, this is Kendall Cycle Club as well as a cycling podcast, then go to iwaka.co.uk Il Ristorante So Arostacini is from the Abruzzo area of Italy, which is actually a very rural, mountainous region. Strictly speaking, it's sort of central west, but it feels a lot more southern. I have been there and just remember it being incredibly beautiful because it's so, in general, so rural and remote. The agriculture there is is largely sort of sheep herding and things like that. This dish is very much a shepherd's dish. It's basically lamb kebabs or lamb skewers, and it's the kind of thing that, you know, little pieces of meat cut small so they cook quickly and the kind of thing that shepherds could have eaten, could have prepared while they were looking after their flocks on in the mountains. It's a very, very simple dish. You don't marinate the meat. You literally just a bit of salt, cook it on an open grill, serve it with some bread, some olive oil, maybe some of the lovely Monte Pulciano d'Abruzzo wine or something else nice and rustic and red. The important thing, I think, if you're making it at home is to not go for anything too lean because I think traditionally, as with most kebabs, you would be using a mixture of sort of pieces of fat and fatty meat and leaner bits and you might be using mutton and etc if you're just buying one cut i'd probably go for something like shoulder or maybe a mixture of breast of lamb and lamb steaks just to make sure it doesn't dry out on the grill and also make sure you really squash the meat down on the skewers so it doesn't dry out but yeah simple and very delicious well, Felicity, my lamb kebab skewers were a fantastic lightish lunch. The Italians traditionally cook them on the barbecue using something called a fornicella, which you can suspend the skewers above the flame so the lamb fat drips down and you get a, a nice smoky uh, effect. But I cooked mine in a very, very hot griddle pan. I took your advice and cut the lamb up small. I separated the, the meat from the fat and I kind of distributed the fat evenly and I really packed it on so it was a very tight kebab of, of just meat. And then I sprinkled some, some really nice coarse sea salt on and just watch them smoke on the griddle pan until basically they were ready to turn when they were you know I could wriggle them free without them without them sticking and leaving half the meat on the pan and they were absolutely delicious just with some rosemary roasted potatoes and a a little bit of aioli I was going to ask what the salad cream besides (laughs) was now I realise it was aioli I have to say that authentically delicious as the alleged aioli looked authentically apparently that you should only really have them with some sort of rustic bread and olive oil but I guess you know as as you cook them in a frying pan I suppose authentically might be out the window but I did notice that you had a nice glass of red wine alongside was that a uh, Montepulciano d'Abruzzo I couldn't zoom in quite close enough to tell the great variety so I'll, I'll go with it it was and um, yeah they look really good I like the fact that you'd, you'd left a track on it looks nice I might have had them a little bit more charred but then you weren't doing them on barbecue so that's quite hard apart from your inauthentic accompaniment I, I was impressed by these they look lovely Well, it's a rest day, and we, we seem to have been talking about um, food uh, quite a lot already. But another another visit to the uh, to the the Watford branch of the the Napalm Restaurant there, very tasty that sounded. Indeed, indeed, a very tasty rest day lunch. Extremely simple, just just lamb shoulder on on kebabs. Absolutely delicious, uh, with a nice glass of red wine from uh, the Abruzzo region, 
Um, yeah, well, why not? Monte Pulciano, any tasty notes, Napalm? Very tasty. It went very well with the lamb. Oh, bit acidic, uh, Monte Pulciano, but so you, you don't often get good <laughs> stuff in the UK. I can see you rolling your well, eyes. Well, the eye, the eye um, rolling no. doesn't come across in audio, does it? But there we are. <laughs> As long as you had a nice lunch, Lionel, that's the main thing. And and first was, was impressed, yeah. so that's obviously the main the main thing. Have you noticed how Napalm and Felicity have ring fenced the whole, you know, food element <laughs> of this It's a takeover. Well I thought I'd get I thought I'd get an expert in and defer to the expert. <laughs> oh, you know? oh. Anyway, on with uh, on with today's on Shot, with shots today's fired. episode. Richie Port. We've got an interview with Richie Port that you spoke to him recently, Daniel. Very interesting and, and a, a long interview and actually we'll put quite a lot of it on the Friends feed. So today we're going to hear Richie Port on his first year as a pro and how he came to join uh, Saxo Bank. And we'll hear about the, the stage in question from 2010, his first Grand Tour, obviously, when he ended up in the pink jersey. But for a longer um version with Richie Port going on to talk about the rest of his career that will be on the friends feed so sign up as a friend if you want to hear a bit more from Richie Port we're going to hear in a moment uh, from Richie Port about how he came to turn professional but right at the start of this episode we he- heard him talk a little bit about the the earthquake that hit the area the previous year we are rich there were a succession of, of very bad earthquakes that hit central Italy over well, a period of, of 20 years, really. So the first one was 1997 in Umbria, and it, it, there were, well, it was a national scandal, really, how long it took to, to repair the damage, rehouse people after that earthquake. 2009, there was another one, um, which is the one we're going to mainly focus on today. So in April, early April 2009, the city of L'Aquila um, was really devastated by an earthquake. 80,000 people lost their homes. I mean, again, um, 10 years later, over 10 years later, not everything has been rebuilt. Not everything has been repaired. There are still sort of churches and, and schools that um, are in a pretty bad state. And um, there was another one, um, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. So 2016, 2017, in the area of Amatrice, and um, yeah, and this is all part of our kind of theme, a bit of a theme for our Giro of um, rebuilding, um, rebirth of of Italy. Um, you know, we, we talked a week ago in our first episode about how the Giro, when it does come back, we hope it comes back this year, um, is going to sort of symbolise and hopefully, you know, galvanize in a way um, this, this sort of reconstruction of, you know, Italy, Italian national sort of the confidence, the, the Italian economy. And um, yeah, the, the 2009 um, earthquake was, was a significant moment for the Abruzzo region. And the following year, 2010, the Giro was going to go to L'Aquila. And it turned out for Richie Port to be a very significant stage. First time I ever saw you, I think, was at the, the Worlds in Mendrisio in 2009. I remember watching the road race the men's elite road race and you, there was like a gazebo set up with all the HTC directors were there so Alan Piper was there and um, Bob Stapleton and, and I remember you, you being in there and I asked someone um, you know who's that guy and, and I think they said your name and, and I sort of assumed maybe you were going to turn pro for HTC um, because you know you seem to be very tight with Piper and, and so on but that didn't happen um, and you turned pro with Saxo Bank so I mean, that in itself was a bit of, that was sort of against the odds, wasn't it? Because I don't think they they had a a place for you, um, but you you managed to sort of win Bjarne Rees over, twist his arm, is that right? I mean, I was lucky to have that Australian connection there that Mick Rogers kind of set that meeting up with HTC during the race as well. Not long after, I was lucky enough that Bjarne Rees was walking the opposite way to me and and, um, Stuart O'Grady and Brad McGee said he'll be in um, Mendrizio. So if you see him, just introduce yourself, and and, which I did. You know, he said to me that he didn't have uh, any places left for the next year but he'd be down in Toscana where I was staying on holiday the week after so he'd um, catch up with me and I was lucky enough that you know he looked through my testing results from MAPE and all my blood passport results from the the year and um, you know by the end of that conversation I had a contract with what was the best team in the world at the time and I mean you know it wasn't the easiest time uh, the three years I had in Italy to come away with a contract on, on that team was just felt like justification for packing up my life um, in Tasmania and moving to the absolute other side of the world and paid off. 
Reese decides to sign you and then you go to the training camp which I think was in Gran Canaria and uh, I mean one of the ways in which you made an impression I think was that um, Bjarne Reese and maybe a couple of others thought you were dead in the swimming pool because you swam underwater for, for so long is that right is that right uh, we just had to do a test to you know who could swim the furthest I think Jens did 50 meters but you know, me with my background as a swimmer, I I, I don't think I swam like 72 meters underwater in a 50 meter pool, and, and they thought that I was going to pass out. But um, you know, the first little thing that got me in, you know, Fabian pulled me out of the the, the water afterwards, you know, up the ladder and big pat on the back, and Bobby Julik then took a bit of an interest in me and stuff. So it wasn't such a big deal being from a swimming background to do that, but it did impress those guys. And you mentioned a couple of names that were in that team. It was full of experienced names and um, guys who had already had very decorated careers. I mean, how have you sort of cast your mind back to that camp in those first couple of months? I think Reese was a bit critical of your weight at first. But, I mean, how sort of intimidated were you? What was your sort of frame of mind in those first couple of months? Firstly, yeah, Bianca told me I was too fat to be a bike rider and I remember him looking at me um, when we were about to do our underwater swim, <laughs> I could tell he wasn't really impressed with my shape. When you turned up to a team camp and, you, you know, Fabian is there, Jens is there, Stewie, the, the Schleck brothers and uh, Matty Breschel, so many guys that you'd watched on television. And then you got to know them and they were just normal, everyday knockabout fellas. That was a nice thing. And Probably the guy that made the biggest impression on me um, at that camp was Nicky Sorensen, who was, I remember watching him uh, win a stage in the tour that year and then, you know, got to spend a bit of time with him, um, you know, hiking and stuff like this. And he was just one of the hardest guys on the bike, but off, off it, he was, you know, all about his girls and, and bird watching, things like this. So, they probably he was probably more the guy that I clicked with um, straight away. And what do you think, or, or what do you remember, sort of feeling about where where this was all leading in professional cycle? What did you think your sort of place was going to be in the sport in, the, in those first few months? Yeah, look, I think obviously on the first camp, you you don't really know um, what to expect. But then we did, you know, quite a lot of testing. It was a, a Saxo Bank camp, so you know we did races in training and um, we did some time trial stuff and you know I was sort of second behind Jakob Fugelsang in in the time trial and Frank Schleck said to me he said yeah you've actually got some talent so I thought you know maybe I can make a go of it coming from being an amateur and you're in awe of all these guys don't think I really thought too far ahead until I did my first races in, in Mallorca and realized that it was hard, harder than I expected. And you're a neo professional, and you've watched these guys whole life racing on TV. You, you don't really think it's your place to be up there banging bars with them. Certainly, that's how it was when I turned professional, and it's probably not quite the same now. You know, you see neo pros come in, and there's probably not that level in, of intimidation in the bunch anymore because cycling's changed so much. But for me, straight away, I think that the hardest thing was that finding a place in the bunch. And, you know, if, if a, a big pro gives it to you for being in their way, then you do sort of have to uh, pull the brakes on it and get out of the way. And I think that that made it harder was when you're at the back of the bunch, you really are just cannon fodder. Everything that happens at the front of the bunch is magnified when you're almost last wheel. So for me, that was probably the hardest part was learning that and you know trying to gain respect without getting in people's way and and the other aspect of it is that you were well you ridden your sort of first races when you're about 2021 20, so you were still quite new to it you know new to bike racing generally but you also newish to europe um you you know you'd had your experiences in tuscany um and so on but you was young in that respect what were your sort of in that first year what were your kind of life circumstances where were you living um who were you you, you sort of hanging out with, with who were your who were the big sort of influences on your life at that point actually lucky that there was a guy here called lee Bryan or rock as everyone knows him and he's from my hometown in in tassie and i knew his father from the tasman institute of sport so he really looked after me, but at the time he was in, he was with um, Ducati in MotoGP, so he was traveling quite a lot. But he was really the, the guy that bent over backwards to make me feel home in Monaco. 
when he was around, you know, go for dinner with him and, and things like that. So I was lucky to have a bit of home, a bit of camaraderie, you know, he turned out to be one of my best mates. So in those respects, uh, it was okay. But then, you know, when you move from Italy to, to Monaco, you can't just move into Monaco. And I was lucky that... Um, yeah, I was about to say, how did that come about? You know, at that stage, you needed 50,000 euros in the bank at any one time. And and I was lucky that um, my bank, who I'm still with, kind of said, okay, we've seen cyclists come in. He's not on, you know, that was my salary at the time was 50,000 euros. So I wasn't going to be able to um, put that up. But, you know, then I was also lucky that my parents were in the position to also help me out with all that sort of thing, you know. And the bank, um, they sort of wrote the attestation to the, the government to say, he's not got this money in the bank, but we will guarantor, you know, that eventually he will get on his feet and um, eventually that was how it is but you know I remember when I first moved to Monaco I went to buy a vacuum cleaner and uh, you know I didn't know if I had enough money in the bank to pay for 120 euro (laughs) vacuum. The cycling podcast at Our Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for fueling me around our Giro and for supporting the cycling podcast and supporting you. If you want 25% off all your Science and Sport products, go to scienceandsport.com and enter the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25. I'm Arcord. I remember... Where are we, Daniel? Well, Rich, we're in a quite spectacular location. We're above, a long way above the Lago di Zeo, which is near tomorrow's start in Lovere. It's stunning, isn't it? It's been a miserable day today, raining most of the day, but it's stopped raining. The clouds are just sort of hanging there, and it's it's stunningly beautiful. Really still, isn't it? Yep, we're above the clouds, aren't we? We're above some clouds, sort of tippy-tappy, little wispy bit. Like Mark Pantani's hair before he shaved it off. <laughs> yeah. There's a hot tub over there. We were we were tempted to podcast in the hot tub, weren't yeah, we? Yeah, um, and we, we were trying to think of us, think to ourselves, what would Lionel do if he were if he was I here? He'd be, he'd, he be in the, he'd be in the hot tub with a lovely <laughs> glass of pink Prosecco. We've got cats crawling all over us here but that's fine I can't actually sit on my chair probably because of a cat that's all right that's fine that's cats for you isn't it so Daniel this is our press conference shall we just get straight into your questions um yes Rich the latest from um our position on the terrace overlooking Lago di Zeo is that Mattia Catania has had enough to eat now and he's been replaced by Dario Catallo <laughs> who's also who's tucking in himself oh Dario Who's Either. finished polishing off the last crisps yeah. that Catania didn't wolf down. I'm not sure if crisps are good for cats, are they? Well, I don't know. Let's soon find out. A uh, lot of water, a lot of cold. Uh, it was the uh, start of the Giro, more or less like this. A uh, lot of rain uh, every day. 2010 was one, uh, one year later after the earthquake in L'Aquila. And now are uh, 10 years, so it's a, it's a special moment for, for that city. I was training many times when I was younger in, the, in that place, so uh, uh, I feel it more even for, for that reason. And when something like that happens, and it's happened a few times in Italy with earthquakes, it doesn't just get re- repaired and sorted out in a year does it i mean the people of l'aquila and, and abruzzo they're still living with the consequences living with consequences but l'aquila is actually is a city who is is coming out in a very nice way i have been there a few days ago and uh, and i saw it really a city and will be very beautiful to see it how how it was uh, just after the earthquake and now that is uh, again is uh, is coming up more beautiful than before. Well, today's Amor Cord, um, Daniel, took us back a year uh, to a rest day, the second rest day last year, when we were invaded by cats who made off with one of our crisps. And then we, we heard from one of the cats, didn't we? Who now rides from Movistar. Well, I think we heard about the feline Dario Cataldo, and then we heard from the real Dario Cataldo uh, speaking to me last year, revisiting the stage that we're going to speak about in a lot of detail today, to L'Aquila. That's also pretty close to where Dario Cataldo is from. Just before we move on, we should make it clear you shouldn't feed crisps to cats. We did get an email from a friend of the podcast who's a vet last year um, complaining that we had uh, endorsed the feeding of crisps to cats. We hadn't, of course, and the cats were, were crisp thieves rather than 
being fed by us. I, I don't think I mentioned this last year, but my cat, Smudge, um, God rest his soul, um, used to eat poppadoms. He used to love a poppadom. <laughs> we used to have a cat called Smudge. No. We did. Domino and Smudge. I also used to call, well, my cat had two names, um, Smudge and Gabrielle Catistuta. So we, we heard from Richie Port about how he came to join the world to quite an unconventional path, really. A little bit like uh, the episode we had a few days ago with Cadell Evans, who um, came from mountain biking and made an immediate impact. Richie Port also made, you know, came from triathlon and, and made a pretty immediate impact, didn't he? Yeah, he did, Rich. And I mean, as far as we were concerned from the outside, it looked as though he'd really taken to professional cycling like a duck to water. Um, you know, he's very, he's very at home in the in the pool. I think his dad used to manage a swimming pool. Rich had spent a lot of time in swimming pools. Never used to venture into the sea, um, apparently. Um, I remember reading once because he was scared of sharks. But um, he... Fair enough. He had, had had a sort of... Well, he'd been on a fast track. He'd, he'd started racing quite late and um, had a, a bit of a meteoric rise. He'd ridden a couple of years in Italy and um, done very well there. Um, won a time trial, I think, in the baby Giro and was so impressive there that faced sort of suggestions from um, some of the local riders. Um, some of the local riders who went on to become quite big-name pros that there was something untoward. Yeah, what we what we didn't know is that he was actually really struggling in the first couple of months. In terms of results in that first year, I mean, we said, um, you know, it was a, a culture shock, but despite that, you, you hit the ground running, really. You, in particular, you win a, a time trial at the Tour of Romandie and you... You win that in such a way that comes a couple of months after or a month or so after there have been all these wild rumours about Fabian Cancellara having a motor in the in the classics. And I think there were some rumours or there were some people suggesting that you had a motor in that Tour of Romandie yeah, time. Yeah, look, time. I mean, to be honest, it all probably started in Paris Nice where I went and had an absolutely terrible time. I mean, it, just before the race started, one of my good mates was killed in a cycling accident back home in Tassie so I wasn't really in the frame of mind to be racing in you know crosswinds the first time that I ever really rode in crosswinds and and just took an absolute kicking and then on the last stage Bjarne gave it to me he said look you're too fat to be a professional cyclist and and you don't have it and was that the second time then that he said that to you after the did he say yeah. once at the camp and then once at Pronies right yeah and even um Kim Anderson who's my director sportif now in in Trek said to Piana he said like this guy doesn't have it he can't even stay in the bunch they should get rid of me <laughs> I got given that kicking and then I came back and and Brad McGee really took me under his wing then he gave me you know day by day he was out on the scooter with me and, and got me really got me going well so then when I turned up to Romandy I remember the prologue and Brad was awesome on the radio behind me and then the first corner I crashed straight over the barriers <laughs> you know I didn't have the, the greatest start but yeah then then that time trial in Romandy you know it was just one of those days I've heard all the all the rumors of you know, this and that. I didn't hear about the, the people thought I had an engine in my bike, but I heard that, that people said um, that they started me early. And then there was another one that Brad McGee motor paced me behind the car, which if anyone knows Brad McGee, there's no way in the world he'd do something like that. But I think maybe one thing that might have happened was I went so early that it probably did have more favorable wind. But it was funny because one of, the, one of my teammates I had in Sky um, was with Castapan at the time and, and a few years later I had that conversation with him where he said that everyone thought that I cheated and what did I do and, and I said to him I didn't do anything and in the end he took my word for it but people I guess are always going to question things but I think I showed um, you know in the Giro I think I was sixth in a prologue so I think I showed that, you know, I did have the credentials. I'd also won the, the time trial the year before in the baby Giro beating Adriano Malori. So I did have a little bit of pedigree, uh, you know, if people cared to have a look, which with a lot of those people that make comments, they're 
you know, haven't really done their research anyhow. What had changed in the space of the sort of month or six weeks since Pioneers? I mean, you said that Brad McGee had worked a lot with you. I mean, what what, what were the key things? I mean, how, how heavy were you, for example? Were you Was it a case of losing a couple of kilos and then Bjarne was sort of satisfied? Or To be honest... I think I got back from Paris-Nice and I got on the scales and I was like 68 kilograms, which, you know, compared to this year when I was, you know, Paris-Nice, that was about 10 kilos more. But, I mean, that, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's, you know, you get a, a Neo Pro from the other side of the world and you make him move somewhere and I wasn't really given any help by the team. I was just told that, you know, you have to live here. That was it, really. I remember I had to hire a Fiat Panda and drive with my three bags from Tuscany up to to Monaco and that was you know there was no help from any of the team you know it is what it is and you know it all it all worked out but it could just as well you know that um, I could have been back in Tassie working nine to five the next year too but I think what really changed for me um, in that period was I was you know angry and I wanted to show them what I was made of and I was I was ready to fight, you know, and that was the big thing. I was a, a little bit more disciplined with the diet and had trained hard and, and um, you know, it's the old cliche, isn't it? But that's really what it was, just a bit of bit of fire in the belly. And then you get picked for your first Grand Tour, the Giro. Um, it's, it was a very experienced team um, they sent there. Baden Cook, Gustav Larsson, two Sorensons, Chris Anker and Nicky and a couple of others. I mean, what was your role supposed to be going into that Giro? What did they want from you there? My role there was just to just to get through it, really, and, you know, just use that first Grand Tour as a as a stepping stone and, and try and figure out what sort of a rider that I was going to be. I mean, there was absolutely no pressure on me. Um, even from the get-go. That team were only really there for stages. Nicky Sorensen was there just for the first two weeks to build his form towards helping the Schlecks in the tour. So there's a you know young, inexperienced team as well as those older, experienced guys you know who were just hunting for form or, or stages. So really relaxed. And you mentioned the good prologue. You, you took the white jersey off the prologue. I think you got lost... Um, on the way back to the podium to try well, to, to receive the white jersey. Is that right? That was just me. I've still got that. I've got absolutely no sense of direction. I obviously got that off my mother because she's the same. But, yeah, I had to go and get the, the white jersey. And um, I got absolutely lost. And I was lucky that Sean Yates, who was with Sky at the time, um, saw me riding around aimlessly and stopped and, and he, uh, you know, he gave me a lift back to the podium presentation. And I remember it was on Mother's Day in Australia, the podium presentation. And I, um, I missed the slot on TV, so my mum was most upset with me. But uh, you know, then I was lucky to hold onto that jersey for quite a long time after. So I got plenty more podium presentations afterwards. The, the first week of that year was quite event for the first 10 days there were a lot of sort of gc stages stages where um time was won and lost and there was the famous stage to montacino in the um on the white roads and in the rain a pretty brutal day and the terminillo as well the first mountaintop finish but you were sort of you were holding your own you were sort of finishing between 10th and 20th place a lot of the time but can you remember how how you you felt on this those first few days i mean as you said you weren't thinking that you were going to be riding for GC, I don't suppose, at that point. I, I remember that those, the, the stages after were just an absolute, f- like, just a fight every day. And, yeah, I, I made it through. I remember being involved in a mass pile-up with Christian Vanderweld on a, on a roundabout there somewhere in Holland. And I think it was just the youth thing. Like, I just went there and rolled up the sleeves and, and punched on, you know, just got on with it. And I just enjoyed it and had a ball, really. And then I also remember the the stage to Montalcino. I'll never, I mean, I'll never forget that. It was one of the, the hardest days um, I'll probably ever have on a bike. So Richie Port in his first year with Saxo Bank, he's picked for the Giro d'Italia, the 2010 Giro, um, started in Amsterdam, the Giro. Bradley Wiggins won the prologue time trial it was team sky's first year their first grand tour as well and um, but it was a very anarch- anarchic race um some fantastic stages stage seven over the 
the White Roads, um, won by Cadell Evans from uh, Alexander Vanukarov, was really one for the ages. I watched that one again recently. It's a brilliant, brilliant stage to watch. And it did seem as if um, it was, like I say, a very chaotic, very anarchic uh, edition of the Giro. Yeah, it was shaping up, wasn't it, into a battle between Vinokurov, who had the pink jersey, Cadell Evans, Vincenzo Nibali and Ivan Basso were the next challengers. Vinokurov already had a minute and 12 over Evans going into this stage 11, but there was no real sense, was there, that, that anyone was, you know, had a stranglehold on the race. It wasn't like, uh, you know, Astana were unbeatable by any stretch. And so... Stage 11, you know, very difficult roads and it presented an opportunity for a, a real ambush. I mean, it was uh, it was an extraordinary stage. One of those days when, you know, a third of the peloton or so or a quarter of the peloton are, are actually in the in the break. And the, the, the gap was going up and up and up and uh, the race was being completely turned on its head. So I was looking at the road book. What you saw was 262 kilometer stage. I mean, had you ever ridden that far before? race that far i'd never raced that far but i remember that stage at the start there there was quite a big group that went but it was i remember the road was kind of um all graded like it was still bitumen but really bumpy so we had to jump onto the gutter so we probably had you know like a, a meter either side and that's kind of how it it was like a, a break in the bunch that was caused because it was hard but then it was like Astana, I think, kind of let it go. I mean, Vinokurov had the, the jersey. The gap is going back out again, and this is a real disaster for Vinokurov, Evans, Basso, Nibali et al. The pink jersey on the shoulders of Alexander Vinokurov, well, at least until he rolls over the line, there are a whole group of other riders back in the hunt. Javier Tondo, Carlos Sastra, and Richie Porte, bit of an unknown quantity for some of these bigger riders Richie Port but he seemed to be so strong he can climb maybe not a pure climber but he can climb pretty well more to the point he can time trial and that must be uh, uh, something that they'll have to look out for Richie Port then takes over the pink jersey head of David Arroyo at 142 Kizilovski at 156 Tondo at 354 and Yoli Efemkin, Gerdeman and Sastra back in the top eight. Seven minutes and nine seconds down. What an extraordinary day. I remember people saying that I got lucky to get the jersey, but then on that day I remember like Wigo was there, Sastra who'd won the tour two years before and and, and these guys were all there. I mean there was a, a lot of firepower in that front move and I remember Xavi Tondo came up to me, you know, when he was riding with Cervello and Sastra was next to him and he said, you're going to be in the pink jersey at the end of the day because we already had 16 uh, minutes after 60k, something like this. And But then I did the maths in my head and it was, you know, 200k's to go and I knew it was going to be such a hard day. It was already freezing and, you know, the, the maths that I did in my head was that's the, the distance between the capital city in Tassie called Hobart and, and Launceston. And I'd done a race um, before earlier in my career, Launceston at Hobart, and I remembered how much I'd suffered on that day. And, you know, we were in for it with the weather and, and the climbs and stuff. So I knew that I just had to hold him to that group and, and I'd take the pink jersey. I just remember it being super hard when when the break went and I guess then there was that game of chess behind, you know, Cadell, Basso and and all those guys sort of and Vinokurov looking at each other and, and none of them helping. So I think that kind of partly, you know, maybe Astana messed it up and by the time they'd realised how much of a mess they'd made, they couldn't you know, they couldn't get it back and also the the group that I was in in the front were working really well together i mean we had some big firepower up there pulling as well and even when the teams behind us got together and you know and and worked um you know they didn't take that much time out of us anyway but you know it wasn't really until the last sort of 30 k's that i really thought yeah you know i'm going to take this 
this jersey and uh, you know even to this day makes the hair sort of you know it gives you those weird feelings it was just you know one of the, the most incredible things that could have happened to me so you were 142 ahead on GC that night but I think things started to to turn take a turn for the worse even that evening didn't they <laughs> yeah I remember that evening I was roommates with um Laurent Didier I said that I, I was like having uh you know like I was I was um just sweating you know like had, had like a fever and I thought it was just you know just one of those things of having exerted myself so so much that then I said to him uh you know are you you sweating and he looked at me and he said uh you don't look right and um so we had to get the doctor to come in and the do- doctor came in and said to me he's like yeah you, you've obviously got something off the road something's sort of you know got I had a fever and you know I went from being on top of the world to to hardly being able to sleep and you know had the the good old gastro um and and to be honest if I didn't have the jersey I probably probably wouldn't have started the next day I think the next day was probably one of the hardest days I had on the bike just from you know that I couldn't eat uh, and I you know throwing up and, and and everything else that goes with gastro which we won't go into and having to hi- having to hide it as well, I suppose, from yeah. your, your competitors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I remember that the um, there was one there was a female journalist there, and and she picked it. She said that to me um, after the stage in in the interview. You know, how's your health? Is are you okay? Um, you know, and I had to pretend like you know it was good and everything was okay. But luckily, the few days after that um, stage, I think everyone was put put in the box so much and they weren't you know they were the typical transition days and the weather was better that um you know I didn't really have to exert myself but then the last day I had that jersey I remember Sky um I could see them all queuing up and on the front of the climb and I knew that that was it that I was going to lose the jersey but I you know it was the most incredible days um riding that jersey and everyone on the side of the road was you know um, screaming out and Maglia Rosa and yeah, you know, it was just one of the most incredible things you can have as a bike rider is to to wear a leaders jersey in, in a, a Grand Tour. David Arroyo ended up holding on for quite a long time um, at the towards the top of the general classification, and um, you know, one stage looked a real threat in terms of winning the race. I mean, um, what were you thinking in those next few days? You obviously had to had to start. Um, wondering about general classification and, and seeing um, how long you could hang on. But, I mean, do you think that the illness affected you throughout the rest of the race, even when you were, you know, in theory, better? I think, to be honest, like once it had passed, it, it had passed. Um, I don't think at that time there was, there was no way, even if I had 20 minutes, that I was going to hold on to that jersey um, all the way. But... Um, Arroyo, he came pretty close to it. I mean, he, he rode absolutely fag, um, magnif- magnificently for <laughs> the rest of the race. But, um, you know, for me, just to have had that, um, pink jersey for, for three days was awesome. But then I had the white jersey and that was really when we had a, a great battle. Um, you know, we had Kizilovsky, um, who was doing all sorts of, crazy things like holding on to cars to, to race against Balka, Molomer and me, you know. Is, so that was probably my, my next priority was to um, try and take that that jersey. Yeah, then to, to finish uh, like seventh there um, in Verona was just, you know, awesome. But I don't think I got too far ahead of myself on, on you know, what sort of a rider I was going to be. But, you know, then the, the week after was – that was when you know everything kind of went crazy and um you know getting offers from teams even though i had a a contract with saxo for the next year and that's kind of when it all sunk in that you know maybe i did have a future as a professional bike rider so that was richie port on the stage that really announced him to the the world i suppose he took the pink jersey there are parallels as i've said with Cadell Evans in 2002 but it was uh it was a remarkable stage in what was a pretty extraordinary 
Giro, a real sense that day that a lot of riders were, were coming back into contention. And one of the favourites who would eventually end up winning finished 12 minutes back that day, Ivan Basso. Yeah, Rich, it was one of those fantastic Giro stages where the recriminations last for several days and there were a lot um, after that stage. I remember speaking um, to Gianni Savio um, afterwards and um, he, of course, had Michele Scarponi as his team leader and um, Savio and other other people, other riders, other teams as well felt that without the help or without the input of um, Androni, then Liquid Gas and Vasso would have would have lost the Giro that day, um, would have forsaken their chance to win the Giro because um, there was this moment, um, well, there was a long period of the race when Astana and Liquid Gas seemed mystifyingly not to be moving. And I mean, Liquid Gas had four guys in the break, so you know they had a good excuse not to really do much behind. The, the break as the advantage went out I think it went out to 17 minutes at one point um, but Astana's lack of movement was quite was quite surprising to say the least and and was never really adequately explained but you know it could easily have turned into well we mentioned the other day didn't we uh, Clerici who won the the Swiss rider who won the Giro in 1954 Roger Walkowiak and of course famously also in the 50s won the Tour de France with a, um, what they call in Italy a fuga bidone like a, a lucky break it could easily have turned into one of those and in fact David Arroyo um, held on for a very long time and um, you know I remember um, later in the race, how how impressed people were with him, in particular his descending. I remember was was exceptional, and he was managing to make up and um, recoup quite a lot of time on on the descents. And he gave the the favourites and Basso in particular, who went on to win the race, some very nervous moments. Arroyo had also ridden extremely well on that stage I mentioned earlier, stage seven, hadn't he? The White Road stage, which was a real a real battle, and he was. He was one of the guys up there, along with Marco Pinotti, actually, one of the four or five riders who were able to go with uh, Vinukarov and Evans. Yeah, one of the other riders in that break was Bradley Wiggins, who finished fourth on the stage to L'Aquila and, and dragged himself back up into the top ten after a few days where his his first uh, Grand Tour as Team Sky's leader had been unravelling a bit. But it was a bit of a false dawn for Wiggins because... He didn't do very well in the rest of the mountain stages and was back in the, well, more or less the Gruppetto on the, the Zonkalan stage. Finished 40th overall. And I suppose that is where the pressure began to pile onto Wiggins' shoulders. Uh, the expectation that had all been built up in 2009, uh, firstly with a very promising GC result at the Giro and then, of course, fourth place at the Tour de France. And he was going to go into the Tour as Sky's leader um, but he even well by the end of the Giro, um, you know, it was it was starting to to look a little bit unlikely that he was going to be able to uh, repeat his success from the previous year. And just thinking about the the legacy of that Giro for Richie Port chaps, I mean, f- for many years, seventh place, um, his final position in that Giro was his best finish in a Grand Tour and his only um, Grand Tour top ten. And it, it struck me. And it certainly strikes me now that he was really cursed and damned by that, well, finishing position of seventh in the Giro. It really did set expectations um, unrealistically high. And, I mean, he's one of those riders that, you know, you can almost draw up an algorithm for a rider's career or a a rider who um, is criticised for, you know, not attaining certain standards because of a performance early in their career or because on... On certain days they are better than guys who are winning Grand Tours and and that is exactly the case with Richie Port. you know he had this seventh place which he he sort of planted a flag there and then in the years thereafter you know he would have often he would have days where he was a better climber than you know Chris Froome or you know even Alberto Contador Ivan Basso whoever it may be you know I think Richie himself as you know we're going to post the, the rest of this interview on the friends feed and Richie talks about this in quite a lot of depth Richie never really felt that he was better than those guys and he was better equipped to win grand tours than those guys but you know if you if you added those two things together the the flying start to his pro career and those flashes of of absolute brilliance um it was easy to come to the conclusion that he should have been and that it was somehow his fault that he wasn't um that he wasn't achieving those results 
Well, you mentioned, Daniel, that the rest of your interview with uh, Richie Port will be available to friends of the podcast. Well, we hear a little clip from that now. This is him talking about a rider um, who he became teammates and friends with at Team Sky, Chris Froome. I think he's just mentally the toughest guy that there is. I think that's the, I mean, I, I genuinely feel that, you know, there's there's no one in the peloton even now who's as mentally tough as what he is i mean he's he's not had the the easiest of upbringings you know um out of kenya and then south africa so i just think that that's probably the biggest thing that sets for me apart um from myself and 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 a lot of other guys he's just is you know he doesn't really care what anyone says about him or people booing him you know he has a, a good laugh when people were you know, laying into him on the side of the road, he, he, sent, he found it all pretty funny. Whereas, I, you know, I guess that I kind of worry a little bit too much about what people think, whereas that's, you know, he is the opposite way <laughs> and that's what fires him up. Have you watched him a lot over the years and tried to absorb some of that and come to the conclusion that it's pretty much, whether it's genetic or whether it's, you know, its origins are, are deep in someone's upbringing and it's sort of too late when you get to your 20s or 30s to change that kind of thing or has any of it transmitted to you sort of through osmosis or yeah look i mean i think he's just got that killer instinct he really does and i think i have it on my day like you said but you know he's he's 24 7 wired that you know he's he's super competitive and um you know that's just how some people are and i think maybe you know he's his upbringing, you know, it's probably a little bit more tough than, than my, you know, cosy Aussie laid back, you know, upbringing where, you know, my dad surfed. We grew up every weekend on the coast and, you know, really have to, to worry for, for anything. Whereas I guess he's, you know, he's, he's had to fight his whole, um, his whole life. Well, that was a little clip from the longer interview with Richie Port, available to friends of the podcast. Sign up at thecyclingpodcast.com. And don't forget, you can also watch our first film there as well, And So We Rode. Um, thanks for all the reaction to that. I think it's time, chaps, to hear from our good friend Ciro Scognamiglio. Giro Dream Team with Ciro Scognamiglio. Alberto Contador. Yes, I know. Alberto is a climber. It's true. But every rule has its exception. But in this case, the motivation is not a climb or a stage mountain. The reason is that I met him at Vuelta Castilla y León 2007. He was still not so famous. He won at the end this race and he gave him his telephone number. After 13 years, his telephone number is still the same. Thanks, Alberto. This means to know how not to change how to remain the same person. Well, Contador, in spite of what Chiro said about not picking any climbers, um, Alberto Contador gets in purely on the basis that he's never changed his phone number in 13 years. Uh, I'm not sure about that as a selection criterion. Well, at least as team manager, he'll be able to get hold of him whenever he needs to, you know, talk tactics or any other important business. Not going to go missing. That's why Alberto Contador joined Saxo Bank in 2011 and, and sort of blocked the path, really, for Richie Porte. Simply the fact that Bjarne Ries had had his phone number for many, many years and he hadn't changed it, or... I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> there might, I, I suspect there might have been more to it than that. I suspect but, so. But don't want to speculate. Chaps, can I issue a second live correction of the, the podcast? Not doing very well today. Um, I said Ivan Basso made his Giro debut for Amica Chips in 2000. He'd actually made his Giro debut, debut done a few steps stages the year before for Rizzo Scotti nothing to do Rizzo with Rizzo Scotti chips. is that uh, that's rice it, yeah it's risotto rice risotto rice okay yeah from risotto rice to chips to blueberries chips to to blueberries and gas <laughs> cement wonderful. was next actually cement was next it was faster yeah. Waterloo, wasn't it the wonderful world of professional cycling anyway chaps we we should wrap things up for our rest day and um, get back to some resting what's coming up tomorrow 
Well, we've got the on the course. We've got a time trial, fantastic time trial, mountain time trial um, over the, one of the most one of the most beautiful climbs in central Italy. We'll talk more about it tomorrow. But um, it's another it's another nod to uh, as we said this theme of rebirth and the earthquake in 2016, 17 this time. And um, Napalm surely tomorrow because we're going to Amatrice. Surely you're going to be making us a lovely Amatriciana. Yeah, well, there's a bit of a pasta cook-off actually tomorrow. But the main uh, feature in the episode will be an interview with Alex Dowsett. We're talking time trialling and the Grand Tour stage win in the 2013 Giro for Dowsett, which in its way signalled the end of Bradley Wiggins as a Grand Tour contender, didn't it? He was the defending Tour de France champion. Um, he was going to the Giro to try and win it, and it all went wrong from the time trial onwards, really. We might even go... But we'll be focusing yeah, on Alex Dowsett. We, we will focus on Dowsett, and we'll maybe talk a bit about Wiggins, and maybe we'll go all contemporary and talk about the current situation with uh, Chris Froome as well. Who knows? Breaking our own Giro rules. But until tomorrow... Lionel, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you.